People without jobs and jobs without people is how a CIBC World Markets report characterizes a labor market split that the report says is threatening Canada's economic prosperity. And here's the report's author, Benjamin Tal. He is Deputy Chief Economist at CIBC World Markets, and we're glad to have you in that chair here at TVO. A pleasure. All right. I've read the report. You've described a labor market mismatch in Canada, and I want to know what that mismatch looks like to you. Well, what it means, it means that we have companies that simply cannot find people, and we, can have, we have people that cannot find jobs. Even the Prime Minister told us recently that in his opinion, this skill labor shortage is actually the most significant problem facing Canada. And I tend to agree. I think this problem actually is growing and growing and it will impact all of us because it's simply large enough. It's not just about this individual that cannot find a job. It's not just about this company that cannot find the right people. It's about the economy as a whole because it's simply big enough. It will impact productivity and therefore our standard of living. It might surprise people to know what shortages we have. So I have a bit of a list here and I'm going to read a list from your report because yes. you identify 25 occupational areas that are in need of workers. And let's put the list up here. We can do this control room. Here we go. Civil, mechanical, electrical and chemical engineers. Mining, oil and gas, workers and supervisors. Professionals in the physical sciences, life science, and natural and applied scientists. We need physicians, dentists, veterinarians, medical technologists, and technicians. Why are so many companies having trouble finding people to fill these skills? Well, simply we don't have enough people with those skills. And then you can go, why? Maybe the, the educational system, maybe the immigration system, maybe the way we qualify people for those jobs. Many, many reasons, but simply we don't have enough. If you look at Toronto, if you look at Ontario, if you look at Western Canada, we cannot find people, especially in health, dentists, doctors, nurses, which is a major crisis that we are facing. This is one component, but it's not just about, you know, education, PhDs. It's also about uh, manual workers, about plumbers, that uh, people in uh, Alberta will tell you they cannot find. Heavy machinery uh, operators, they cannot find them. You know what? Those are occupations that are really facing major skill shortage. Their wages are rising. There's simply not enough of them. But it can't be that Canadians don't want to do these jobs. I mean, people still want to be doctors. They still want to be vets. They still want to be dentists. Why are we not going into these jobs in the way that we perhaps once did? And that's exactly the point. We need more of them, and we'll need more in the future because we are getting older. This society is getting older. We'll need more and more. We don't have enough. The question is why maybe it's too difficult to become a doctor in Canada. Maybe uh, the professional body is making it more difficult for new immigrants to become doctors in Canada. And then you have this phenomenon that everybody is talking about, a doctor driving a taxi. Major problems in the communication between what the government is submitting to new immigrants and what they face here on the ground. The government is telling those new immigrants, you arrive to Canada because we need you, and then they face those professional bodies, private sector bodies, and tell, you know what? You don't have what we need. Good luck. This is a failure of the system that we are seeing now. I'm going to follow up on the immigration angle in a second, but I want to put the next list of things up, which is these are the professions that you've identified that we have too many of. For example, elementary and secondary school teachers and counselors. In the clerical area, supervisors, clerks, and general office workers, machine operators in metal, mineral, pulp, paper, and wood, managers in manufacturing and utilities, or in fishing, vessel masters and skippers, fishermen, fisherwomen, fishers, whatever they call them nowadays. Um, what's the outlook for people who are looking for work in these areas? Not good, not good. They simply cannot find a job because this is, those are areas with labor surplus. Those are people with relatively low skill or they used to have those skills and they simply lost them because of the fact that they stayed unemployed for a long period of time, so you lose your skills during this period, or simply they're not needed. You know, we're talking about butchers, we're talking about manufacturing sector. We know that the, the manufacturing sector, unfortunately, is shrinking. That's the reality that we are facing. Many of those people simply don't have other skill set that they can apply to other um, occupations, and they are stuck. And that's why the duration of unemployment is rising. It's not only people losing their jobs, it's actually people staying unemployed for a longer period of time, which makes this problem even more difficult because the longer you stay unemployed, you lose your skills. Mm -hmm. And we have no less than 250,000 new Canadians, only basically 20% of the unemployment pool that are unemployed for more than six months. That's huge. And the longer they're unemployed, the less likely they 
can get a job. That's exactly it. They lose yeah. their skills, they lose their employability, hmm. and that's something that we're facing now. I want you, if you would, to look at one of the monitors here in the studio, and I'm going to show a chart now which has got a, a blue line and a red line. And the blue line and the red line, as we'll see, are pretty much the same until about this year. And then you can see that the lines diverge. The red line is the employment rate, and the blue line is the skilled labor shortage. What's happening in 2012, Benjamin, that makes these lines all of a sudden not mirror each other, but rather yeah. spread apart? I think this is a, an early reflection of the problem, namely the extent to which skilled labor shortage is limiting our ability to grow. And that's exactly what I'm saying when I say that this is not just a micro problem impacting the individual or this company, but a macro problem. Basically, if you don't have skilled labor, it means that the labor market is not operating in a very optimal way. Therefore, productivity is not rising. And if productivity is not rising, it means that the economy and the labor market cannot rise in a very significant way. If you look at the number of vacancies, we have roughly 200 vacancies for every 1,000 unemployed. This is a record high, which means that we have people that are unemployed, but still we have rising vacancy rates because we simply don't have the right people. This is the labor market mismatch. Too many people that don't have the skills that companies want and need. But if I look at that graph again, the lines look pretty much the same until around this year. Something's happening right now. There's something particularly unusual happening. There it is again that at the very end of that graph, things get really bad. Yes, I think that until now, if you look at the last three years, that's basically was the recession. In a recession, everything goes more or less at the same uh, line. This is more kind of a normal environment, a recovery, and I suggest that's what we should be expecting over the next 10 years or so. This is really an early signal for what we should expect so in a normally functioning economy. The fact that it went down together, it's simply a cyclical story that belongs to the recession. The recession is not the normal situation. This is the normal situation. But it, from, if I read that graph properly, this mismatch is going to get worse. It will get much worse. That's the issue because the demographic story is not helping us. We know that Canadians are getting older, they will retire, and we don't have enough people. For example, tech engineering. Over the next eight years, we are going to see 95,000 engineers retiring. We don't have anything close to it that, to replace it. So that's one simple example of what we're going to face over the next 10, 15 years. The demographic story of Canada is not positive for this story. So let's talk about solutions. What have you got in mind? Well, that's a very good question and it's very complex. Uh, people talk about immigration as the only solution and the government, if you look what they're doing, basically most of the focus is on new immigrants and I say be careful here. It's simply not big enough to solve the problem. A, we have an army of people here in Canada that are unemployed. We just talked about them. We should use them. Nevertheless, if you look at unemployment and immigration, you basically, if you want to stabilize the ratio of working people to non-working people, if you want to stabilize it, you have to triple the number of new immigrants every mm. year. That's triple because so many of those immigrants don't have the skills either? Exactly. And mm. That doesn't make, we simply... Well, we're, we're not going to do that. We're not going to bring 750,000 so people in. That's right. exactly. So that's not yeah. a practical solution. We have to make sure that those new immigrants that arrive are actually able to fill the gap. And here is the issue. We are not selecting them. They are selecting us. Mm -hmm. You know what? So many countries are after those new immigrants because all of them have the same demographic situation. Mm -hmm. And they are competing. So they are selecting us. What I'm telling you here, Steve, is that they are not lining up. And if we don't attract them, they will not come here. They're not lining up for Canada. Absolutely. In the way that we need them to. Absolutely. So should we be going out and getting them? We should, but we should be attractive to them. How do you do that? You simplify the process. For, for example, the government will go to this potential engineer in China or in Mexico and will promise them all kinds of things. They arrive here and then they face the private sector body and they didn't even talk to the government and it's totally different reality hmm. and they cannot find a job. Although the government told them that we really need you, we desperately need you. So that's something that can be fixed by higher level of coordination between the private sector and uh, the public sector in Australia. They are doing it much better and you can see that the success rate in Australia is double the success rate in Canada. But I saw Jason Kenney not too long ago, the immigration minister, make an announcement 
you know, that dealt with this issue. We want to go out there, we want to, we want to target people who would be the job creators here, who have the skills that we need in this country. He thinks he's making some progress on this. And I agree. I think that uh, we are basically modeling our research changes through Australia. Basically, it's based on Australia. The experience in Australia that is working, we are basically raising the language qualifications which we need, and we are basically looking at the job market and say what we need. The problem is, quickly, is that we are focusing on short-term solutions. Hmm. I'll give you an example. If you look at the 29 occupations that the government is basically saying we need, 30 percent, almost 30 percent, are actually in the construction industry. Huh. Now, we don't have, you don't have to be an economist to predict that the construction industry will not be on fire over the next uh, 10 years because it's slowing down mm -hmm. because the boom in the housing market is over. We have seen exact same thing during the dot-com uh, collapse. You know, before the collapse, we imported so many new immigrants mm -hmm. in this field and they found themselves unemployed after the crash. So we have to look at the long-term uh, you know, trajectory of the labor market, what's needed in the future, not next year, and then we have to basically coordinate our um, immigration policy based on those predictions. I, I, let me leave immigration for a second, and I wonder if there's a role to be played here by high schools, high school guidance counselors, or community colleges who could make the pitch that we need welders, we need tool and die makers. Um, these are areas that uh, perhaps many parents don't want their kids to go into, but we need these people. Do they, are they part of the solution as uh, well? Absolutely. I think that this is an excellent point. We have to basically tell people, listen, going to those occupations is actually not a bad thing. If you look at the future, actually, you will do better, you will do better if you go in this direction, if you have this propensity or if you really like these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Try it. Make it, make it a, a, a possibility. Now, it's basically not very nice. You know, you want to go to universities. Everybody wants to college or university, and you don't see enough people going to those kind of occupations. We need to mm -hmm. change this perception, and that's extremely important. We also basically have to tell potential employers that they have to change the way they think. We don't have enough on-the-job training in Canada. Everybody is expecting the government to solve the problem. I say companies, look at your potential employees, people that maybe don't look uh, or don't do something important now, but have the potential, discover this potential and nourish it and do on-the-job training. Only 30% of companies in Canada are doing on-the-job training, and most of them are large, large companies. We need to see more small and mid-sized companies doing on-the-job training. It's not happening, and that's a big, big failure. Is so, it your understanding that the mindset, perhaps, among those companies is retraining workers is a job for the government. It's not a job for us. Is that what they think? That's exactly it. I don't see much coordination between the government and uh, business, and business is really not taking the next step. They complain about this. They are telling us that 30 percent of them, 30 percent of them are telling us that they face a significant labor shortage that is really limiting their ability to grow, but at the same time, on-the-job training is not something that they are focusing on. That's a mistake from a long-term perspective. Let's, uh, let's finish up on this then, in terms of long-term perspective. If we don't figure this out, what are the ramifications for the Canadian economy as a whole in the long run? It's very significant because we are talking about misallocation of funds, misallocation of labor, and therefore we will not be as productive as we can. This means that the structural unemployment rate, namely people that are unemployable, will be larger and larger and larger. It means that the gap between people who have and people who don't have will widen, and it means that the standard of living of all of us will go down because productivity is the number one force that is shaping our standard of living. And this is not going to happen if you have this mismatch in the labor market. This is, as the prime minister said, probably the number one problem facing the Canadian economy today. Hmm. So it's urgent. We better get it right. Absolutely. That's the message. Benjamin Tal, Deputy Chief Economist, CIBC World Markets. Very good of you to come into TVO today. Toda <laughs> A pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.